Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. On the way to the office, Christopher decided to walk a couple of blocks. The road went through a park with a temple at the back of it. The man loved that place. And now, when there was a wonderful fall weather, it was especially peaceful. And Christopher really wanted to be alone, to think quietly, while he was not surrounded by numerous employees of the company. Not running in with papers and work messages. For several years now, his son has been ill. How many things had been done to get him back on his feet after that terrible accident? But all in vain. And for the last year, Stephen has been fading away in front of his eyes, and there is no hope for recovery. That's what the doctors say. And his granddaughter is also missing. The whole world has been looking for her. Christopher himself involved all his connections when the help of the police could not be hoped for, but Camille disappeared without a trace. Ah, if her granddaughter were alive, close by, never disappeared, Stephen would be relieved. Maybe he'd even have a reason to live, and he would have recovered. All these heavy thoughts tormented Christopher for a long time. It was excruciatingly hard for him to watch his son die. Stephen could hardly even recognize his father anymore. In the rare moments when he regained consciousness, he constantly calls for his daughter. He loved her so much. Where did Camille disappear to? Her body was never found, never ransomed disappeared as if she never existed. Christopher didn't notice as he approached the temple. He often came here to ask the Lord God for help, to ask for his son to get better and for his granddaughter to be found. There were beggars standing at the gate of the temple. Beggars are normal for such places not to serve. If you're asking for something for yourself, if it's a sin to sympathize with someone else's grief. And Christopher served. His eyes fell on a child. A ragged, dirty little girl stood beside of a bushka in a shawl. Her head was busy on some rag, and her coat was quite out of height written off almost to the ground. He looked at her carefully. What a fate for a child, the man thought. Suddenly a crazy idea came into his head. What if he brought this little girl to Stephen, who looked almost as old as Camille would be now? Uncle, give me some money, for God's sake. I see you are a kind uncle. The girl finished in a thin voice. What do you need the money for? I decided to make conversation with the child. Christopher, I will buy a bun and bread, replied the girl. I can buy you lots of buns. And man, get out of here. Unless you want to give the child money. Suddenly rudely cut off his conversation with the child. Grandma, and from the looks of it, seemed so godly and humble. Christopher, not paying attention to the old woman, extended his hand to the girl. Come with me, he said, and she trustingly moved towards him. The old woman blocked the way. But at that moment two guards Christopher grew in front of her, who unnoticeable shadow always followed him. Don't be afraid, little girl let's go. The girl did not dare, gave her hand to the man, and he turned to the guards give the dough money. Christopher put the child in the car and drove away. The grandmother, holding a bundle of large bills in her hands, looked perplexedly after. Emily woke up with a sharp pain in her lower abdomen. It was still dark outside the window. It had begun, she realized. There was nothing left for her to do. To wake up her husband sleeping next to her. Stephen, get up. I think we have to go to the hospital. She called out to her husband. The man did not immediately realize what was wrong. He sat up on the bed and for a few seconds came to his senses from his yodaphone. He was brought out by Emily's moaning. Stephen, I think it has begun. What still did not understand the husband, but seeing squirming in pain, his wife jumped up, fussing for pants and a shirt, he helped dress his wife. She was squirming in pain and moaning. Now dear, don't worry. Stephen soothed her, almost panicking himself. We'll go now and everything will be fine. He helped Emily down the stairs and took her out to the yard. They hadn't put the car in the garage in a month, knowing that labor could start at any time, and there was no point in calling an ambulance, which wouldn't get out of town anytime soon. So Stephen's car was already at the ready. The man sat his wife in the back seat, 
put the key in the ignition. Emily moaned faster. I'm in a lot of pain. Be patient, dear, we'll get there quickly. There were no traffic jams on the roads at night, so Stephen's car sped along the highway at high speed. At the hospital, the woman was placed on a gurney and taken to the maternity ward. Stephen pulled into the driveway. You can't go in there. A stern nurse blocked the way. Wait here or go home. Your wife will call you when she gives birth. But Stephen couldn't leave Emily alone. He seemed to feel a pain in his stomach at that moment. As if it was he who was giving birth and not his spouse. He sat down with his arms around his head. Wait how long? What if something goes wrong? No, everything will be fine. There's nothing the doctors can do. Emily, it was very important for Stephen to be the first to know of the miraculous event, the birth of his firstborn. He's not going anywhere. He would wait here as long as he needed to. With these thoughts, he plunged into the subject. The rash memory drew images of their introduction to Emily wedding. The feeling of endless happiness and imagination gave out pictures of him holding a baby in his arms, feeling like the happiest father. Ah, how happy he is that fate has brought him together with the most wonderful girl on earth. And let her not their circle, let she grow up not in a luxurious mansion, but in an ordinary communal apartment. She is still the most wonderful, tender, and beautiful. They met a year ago at an event. The spectacular girl attracted Stephen's attention, and he resolutely went to her to get acquainted. But the road was blocked by an ambo with a smooth, shaved head. It turned out that the searing brunette accompanied some authoritative man from the circle of businessmen. But Stephen isn't one to give up easily. He's a fighter by nature. And this girl is bound to take notice of him. And she did. On her way to the lady's room, Stephen blocked her way. And she smiled. She noticed him too. You might be in trouble, she said, smiling. Trouble, my companion might not like it. Why are you so insistent on giving me a stare? Do I drink? Stephen smiled. The girl thoughtfully considered him young, about 30 years old, quite handsome. No ring on his finger, dressed expensively. I don't think you're very comfortable in this atmosphere, among the admitted stiffs, Stephen suggested. You guessed it. I want to get away from here to some quiet place where I don't have to pretend to be someone else, but be myself. So what is it? Let's avoid it. Stephen held out his hand to her. How do you like my company? My name is Stephen, by the way. Emily, the girl extended her hand in return. But it's not easy to escape from here. There are guards everywhere. I know a loophole. The man moved slightly closer to her and she smelled the scent of expensive perfume. Come on, come on. They slipped quietly through the back rooms, past the kitchen and out of the grounds. The quiet place was a dock on the shore of the lake. Swans swam in it, ducks near the shore and reeds. Over the conversations, they did not notice how the sun disappeared behind the horizon. But Stephen didn't want to part with his new acquaintance. It's late, I have to go, she said quietly. Looking into his eyes, stay with me, he asked, not taking his eyes off her. It didn't bother him at all that the new acquaintance was from Nice, that she accompanied rich men, perhaps even slept with them. He himself was heir to a decent fortune and could give her a lot of gifts, even if not the whole world, but a part of it. And at this moment he wanted to make her happy. There was something in her gaze that spoke of how bored she was with a torturous event where she was only an ornament. And he brought her to his house. You have a very beautiful house, Emily remarked. It's my father's house. But someday it will be mine. Who's your father? Oh, I'm sorry, this is probably embarrassing. Why not? It's no secret. My father is the co-owner of a construction business. A very busy man and not at all poor, as you can see. Have a drink. Perhaps, the girl replied. It was late at night. It was their first night that had driven Stephen crazy. In the morning, he found Emily gone and a note with a phone number on the table. On the one hand, he was upset. He didn't want to let her go. On the other hand, there was hope in his soul that she was ready to meet him again. He had fallen in love like a boy, 
and it didn't matter what his father said about his beloved. It didn't matter what their acquaintances thought. All that matters is that he's met the most beautiful girl. He would be with her. A week later at breakfast, Stephen told his father he wanted him to meet his girlfriend. Who is she? Asked Christopher. Tell me, son, what family? What does she do? Is she studying abroad or does she have a salon? Is there a woman's business here? What does it matter who she is? Dad? Stephen was outraged. She's just the most beautiful girl, and I love her. The father looked at his son carefully. Are you sure? Of course I am. Otherwise I wouldn't have introduced you to her. All right. Well, let's see. Bring her over to meet her. Stephen was the only son of a businessman. Christopher had given him a good education, had given him a share in the business, but his plan was to marry his son to a girl from a good family, maybe even to one of the daughters of his friends and partners. That evening, when Stephen Emily entered the living room, Christopher looked at the girl carefully, almost no makeup, hair pulled back in a bundle at the back of her head, a simple dress. That she was great and might well have carried off her son was undeniable, but the face said Limita from the Urals. She turned out to be modest, but simple-minded, and her appearance certainly did not fit in the interiors of a luxurious house. Christopher for a minute imagined that she would settle here and would be annoying to see a servant with the rights of a mistress. But what do you do? Asked Stephen's father as they settled around the large table. It's beautiful, the server, the crystal, and the plates. Dad, stop interrogating Emily. What's this about? Trying to stop Stephen's father. What did I ask? I wondered what the young ladies were doing today. Christopher smiled strangely. I want to go to college. I'm preparing, replied the girl, modestly lowering her eyes. How interesting. And in which one? To be honest, I haven't decided yet. In the search, the girl twirled her fork in her hand, hesitating to start eating. In the search, Christopher thought about finding a rich husband, not a university. He increasingly disliked his son's choice. Emily, on the other hand, wanted to get away from Stephen's father as soon as possible and be alone with him. She liked the pretty orchard house very much, and in general Stephen could become her springboard, if not to high society, then at least a luxurious, well-fed life. She wouldn't have to accompany the bigwigs. She wouldn't have to endure their paws on her body. After dinner, Stephen took Emily home. When he returned, he found his father on the terrace with a glass of whiskey. I'm not going to ask your opinion. Dad about the crisis, he said to Christopher. I can see you don't like her. It's not that I don't like her, father replied. It's just that she's not our type. Tell me, who are her parents? Where is she from? She doesn't even have an education. I'm not talking about the fact that she didn't go to a good school like the children of everyone we know. She didn't go to any school at all. Another question is, did she graduate from high school? What does it matter? Stephen was indignant. What does it matter? The father started to lose his temper. Such as, did she foresee a rich boy? She decided to mothball him, become the wife of a promising businessman, and live happily ever after. Emily is not that kind of girl. Just imagine how you'll live with her. She's gonna make you borscht. You're ready to live in a two-bedroom in the suburbs. You can be sure I won't let her into our house. So I'll live in a two-bedroom, and I'm capable of earning a decent place to live. I'm not a boy anymore. And don't tell me who to love, who to love. What do you know about love? Here's your mom was wonderful, kind, intelligent, educated. But you think we married her for love. You're wrong, son. We got married because our marriage was promising for a future life of promise. Here our parents were people of foresight and realized that with such a wife is not ashamed to go out in society, that she will be a reliable rear and never embarrass me. And this is your Emily. She doesn't even know how to behave at the table. That's why she didn't eat anything. All she drank was water. I don't want to talk to you anymore, my father told Stephen. He walked out, realizing that it was pointless to continue the conversation. He was in love with Emily, wanted her to be there for him, so they could have children and raise and educate their boy and girl together. 
No, better two boys and two girls. And the father would gradually get used to his girl. Stephen was sure of this. Emily was indeed born and lived in the Urals in a small town where the only enterprise was a concrete factory. Since her childhood, there were only noisy communal neighbors around her. Their children, who hurt the girl and did not want to play with her. Poverty and hopelessness. Emily's parents occupied one of the rooms. Father and mother worked at the factory, where wages were constantly delayed. In the house sometimes, there were no sweets, and the girl dreamed of candy. The father and mother drank in a drunken frenzy. The husband chased his wife down the long corridor, shouting like, I'll kill her. Where are you, bitch? One day, Emily came home from school, and from the doorstep, she heard her parents drunkenly cursing. Give me the bottle. You bitch, shouted the father. I'll kill you now. You've been drinking it since this morning. Objected already drunken voice mother. The girl quietly went to the kitchen, where the neighbor Aunt Katia cooked borscht. It smelled very good and her stomach clenched. Emily, you're back, roared the neighbor, and yours is again doing since the morning. You've been hungry. Baby, sit down. I'm feeding you soup. The neighbor was a pensioner, so she was almost always at home. She often fed Emily, knowing that her parents may not feed the girl for a week, caring only about how to Oda Verich at wine vodka store. The father's drunken rage often made the mother cry, and then the neighbors called the police, and the district police stopped coming to them, knowing that nothing can be done with this family. My father was taken to the police station, then released. When he returned home, he would start yelling from the doorstep to get a drink. And if his mother wouldn't give him a bottle, he'd hit her again. And so on, and so forth. That's the hell Emily lived in. When she turned 16, she knew for sure that she would leave this poverty, tucked with a blanket on her bed behind a closet, dividing the room into adult and child halves. She dreamed of driving a beautiful car, living in a luxurious house, and her husband giving her flowers and expensive perfume every day and there would be no drunken parents around. She will definitely forget about them as a terrible dream. She stole money for a ticket to the capital from her neighbor, the very one who fed her when her drunken parents forgot about their daughter. She ran to the train station, trying not to look back, but breathed, and she calmed down, only when she got on the train. Now she will definitely not catch up and will not return to a dirty communal room with cockroaches and screaming uneasy drinking from wine, father and mother. Now she will have a new, beautiful and bright life. To the sound of the wheels, she imagined how on the platform she would be met by Prince Charming and taken away to meet him, to her Emily's delight. However, the dreams began to crumble. Just then, there was no prince on the platform. Where to go? The girl didn't know. The city was not familiar to her. Now she did not rush in a convertible to meet happiness, but silently wandered through unfamiliar streets, with each block losing optimism. How much is a pie? Asked Emily. At the street vendor meat table with cabbage and potatoes, 50 go. What prices? Thought the girl. Give me with cabbage, please, and tea and tea, and another 40 did not ceremonize the peddler. Signing Emily counted the change in her purse and gave the right amount. She sat down on the bench and the teenager's tree and thoughtfully survived. What to do next? She didn't know. Where to go? A girl in a strange city with no money. Back to the station and home. But no, it's better to sleep on the bench. The girl didn't notice the woman sitting next to her. What are you dreaming of? Pretty girl, she asked Emily. The girl looked at the stranger beautiful clothes, bright makeup and hairstyle, talked about the fact that she was certainly not a stranger and did not need nothing. Is that so? I know, I don't know where to go. You don't have a place to sleep. It's really getting dark outside. It was getting dark. Emily suddenly felt like crying. Would she have to sleep on a bench now? The stranger with the beautiful makeup kept asking. Yes, Emily sighed. Well, let's get acquainted. My name is Evelyn. Emily, come with me. I'll help you. I came to the capital to find happiness. 
And what did you find? What did you find? The woman was surprised. Happiness. The woman laughed. Well, you know, everyone has his own understanding of happiness. For me, for example, it's enough that I have a house, a job, money. And I live in my own pleasure, not Pasha, like Papa Carlo. I can teach you too. You can, of course. It's not difficult. Come with me. The girl needs a place to sleep anyway. Evelyn took Emily to an apartment where six other girls lived. They were different, but not like her. Confident and beautiful. Meet Emily, girls. She's your new friend now. The girls were friendly. But Emily found them a little strange. However, she was so tired today that she fell asleep as soon as her head touched the pillow. In the two years she had been working for Evelyn, she had learned a lot. How to be inconspicuous, and on the contrary, spectacular when needed. Now Emily was no longer that naive girl who came to the capital for happiness. Are they all unmarried? On one of the first days of her stay in the apartment, she asked Nastya's plump lips. Oh, still is married, laughed a new friend. Why do they need us if they have wives? Emily did not understand. Oh dear, their wives are such mamas in them, that to go out with them in the light Pusateki cannot afford their wives for home, and for children, not for social gatherings. Married men were not part of Emily's plans, but when she met Stephen, she knew she had to take him. This one's available. He took her to a luxurious house and seemed to fall in love at first sight. Plus, he wasn't obnoxious. He was very handsome. Maybe that's the way to go. Luckily, Dad might be an obstacle, though. But she'd figure something out. Not a month later, Stephen proposed to her, and she naturally said yes. The guy was overjoyed. He didn't care that his lover was an escort. And Emily did everything to fall more and more in love with him every day. On the appointed day, the marriage registration took place. Their wedding was a lavish affair. Stephen's father did his best not to fall foul of his surroundings. Stephen brought Emily to the bridal salon and said, pick any dress you want. You know, whatever the bride needs, choose the best and don't think about money. She wasn't going to think about money. Soon, she would forget about thinking about how much money was in her purse at all. So she chose a dress, not based on style and fashion, but the most expensive one. The diamond ring was already shining on her finger, and to it was added a gift from Stephen for the wedding. Beautiful earrings with the same gemstones. Emily was no longer surprised at the way guests behaved at weddings or social events. It wasn't in her rural town, where people would throw a raucous party, drunk to the brim with vodka, and tore up two accordions. Here everything is dignified. No one dances or sings vulgar ditties. Everyone walks slowly through the hall with a glass of wine in his hand nods to each other, strained, smiling, and even do not kiss when they meet, but only lightly touch cheeks. But what does she care? She's already the wife of a businessman whose daddy is rich. Now she will be a mistress in a luxurious house with servants. If only her alcoholic parents could see what their daughter has become. So Emily became the lawful wife of a wealthy young and quite handsome man. A life-changing experience. We are bound to have a baby almost from the first days of our life together. Stephen began to say, let's have a baby. And that's exactly what Emily didn't plan to do. What birth? She had not yet had time to enjoy a luxurious life. But Stephen insisted, and she kept taking birth control pills. When her husband accidentally discovered a vial of medication in her dressing table drawer, there was an uproar. I thought you said you weren't on birth control. You've been lying to me this whole time. You said you didn't know why we couldn't conceive. Emily had nothing to say, so she started crying. Honey, let's just live a little for ourselves. You think having a baby is gonna interfere with our happiness? That's crazy. Babies are the real happiness. But there's the diapers, the positioning, the constant crying in the house, and children often get sick. Emily persisted, hoping to dissuade her husband from the idea of having a baby. Emily, there are nannies for that, but my figure will be ruined after childbirth, and do you love me? 
Emily resorted to a well-known feminine trick. She burst into tears. Stephen looked carefully at his young wife. My fool, I never love you, only for a son or a daughter. Emily realized that there was no way out of the situation and her husband was adamant in his decision. A month and a half later, she realized she was pregnant. The prospect of becoming a mother did not please her at all, but Stephen cried when he heard the news. At first he was confused, but then he picked Emily up and carried her, twirling her around the room in his arms. Daddy, wake up. Stephen was shaken by someone's shoulder. When he opened his eyes, he saw a nurse standing in front of him. You have a daughter, 5'6", weighing 3'200". Congratulations, Daddy. Daughters are a special joy for a father. Overjoyed, Stephen even forgot to ask how his wife is doing. Why don't you ask how mommy is? Oh yes, how's Emily? How is she feeling? All is well with your wife. Tomorrow you can visit her and meet your daughter. In the meantime, go home and get ready to meet your newborn. At home, Stephen and her father raised a glass of wine to the birth of their heiress. I'm glad to be a grandfather, said Christopher, but you must give me a grandchild too. Of course, Dad, there will be many children in our family, and there will always be children's laughter in the house. We'll see, we'll see, Christopher said thoughtfully. Don't doubt it, Father. What will you name your daughter? Is there any doubt? Camille, of course. Do you hear how Camille Sturhapovna sounds? As the song goes, the name Stephen means winner. So our girl will be a double winner. All roads will be open to her. She'll have no barriers. That's a great name, son. Christopher almost wept. A few days later, there was a new resident, a new member of the family. A cozy bedroom was prepared for her. Stephen hired a live in nanny as he had promised his wife. The baby was surprisingly calm. The young father spent almost all his time with her, walked in the garden with the stroller, walked bent over the crib. He even fed her from a bottle himself. Emily immediately refused to breastfeed. Sometimes Stephen thought that his wife was indifferent to their daughter. And then Emily had to pretend to be a caring mother. She clearly understood what Camille meant to her husband. Camille's first birthday was celebrated in grand style. The garden was drowned in balloons. The guests were the same partners of Christopher. They came with boxes, beautifully decorated with bows, carrying gifts and congratulating Stephen on the momentous occasion. Emily watched from the balcony, having no desire to go downstairs and pay with people who were completely unfamiliar and uninteresting to her. But Stephen was completely immersed in the atmosphere of the party. And who is it that came to us? He said to his daughter, Look what clowns have come to visit you. Camille laughed, dressed in a beautiful pink dress. She was a princess, and everyone was running around her, playing with her and lifting her in their arms and tossing her up. Stephen seemed not to notice that Emily was not present among the celebrants. She still paid little attention to her daughter, and he was happy that his little girl had turned one year old. Emily was melting under the strong hands of the monsieur. She had known Robert for a long time, since the time she had been working as an escort, where he worked in an elite salon, serving only VIP clients, and he did not engage in lovemaking with clients. Robert belonged to those who are called persons with non-traditional sexual orientation. Therefore, girls trusted him even the most intimate secrets, which sometimes you cannot tell a friend. But how is your husband? Asked Robert. Beautiful, well-groomed body, Emily. Better not to ask, sighed Emily. Bored to death all the time with his daughter. She's a real sweetheart. It's like he doesn't even notice me and you yourself to him to show attention to be affectionate, be affectionate. I know the type. They quickly find replacements for bored wives with a slight accent of mountaineer, advised the monsieur. Emily hesitated. She didn't want to say goodbye to the luxury she had grown accustomed to, but it was also unbearable to be in a confined space. She and Stephen hardly ever went out. They rarely went out to restaurants and foreign trips to the sea could not even talk about. All her attempts to persuade Stephen to go to a resort were met with the same answers. What about Camille? 
We can't leave her with a nanny for too long. She's just a baby. Don't you understand that? The only thing Emily could accomplish was a trip to the salon. I have to keep in shape. Honey, she used to say. Otherwise, I'll be decrepit and ugly. Like all the wives of your business partners. And do you love me? Stephen agreed. And now Emily legally devoted three days a week to her beloved. Spa manicure. Pedicure. Tanning. Massage. On these days, the girl took the car and went on her own business. Once in a while she could afford to go shopping. But most often her husband would say, why do you need to go somewhere? It takes time. And you have to leave your daughter behind. You can order everything from a catalog. This is not how Emily imagined her new luxurious life. Her plans included trips to the resort, shopping in Europe, carefree vacation in the most prestigious places, bars, restaurants, nightclubs. But family life with the son of a rich man was not like that. Emily constantly needed to be at home, to pay attention to Camille and to run errands for the servants. And she wanted to have fun. Listen, Robert, how are our girls doing? She suddenly asked. They're doing fine, not complaining. Jenna just got back from the Greek islands. A client took her there, a very distinguished man. Jenna is so happy. She came back all rested and wearing all her new tchotchkes. Emily was so jealous. Jenna's better than her, Emily's worse. But relax, you're intense, Robert said. Hey, is there anyone you're interested in, you know? Yeah, I'm really sour on this life. I just want to have fun, relax. How are you gonna leave home? You've got a husband. Won't he like what you've done? Won't he find out? Said Emily, thinking through a plan of action for fun and entertainment. Robert continued to massage the girl's body for several minutes. Silence hung in the room. Then the masher said, I can't recommend anyone from ours. He quickly figured you out here. Why set yourself up? But I have one Italian in mind. He's very rich. Emily raised her head. Tell me who he is, where he goes, what attracts him. At Giddell's restaurant on Fridays. Emily hesitated. Friday was not her day. She's usually out of the house on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays. Is he really that rich? She asked the monsieur. Very rich. He has vineyards in Italy and wineries. Makes wine, sells it all over the world. Married. No. What are you, a bachelor? What is he, an old man or a freak? What's that? The girl was puzzled. A handsome man, said Robert, with his lips. Maybe he's not interested in girls then. Robert laughed. How would I know? Is he or isn't he? Emily. I was curious. Who was this handsome man? On the way home, she wondered how to get out of town next Friday. When she pulled into the yard, Little Camille and her nanny were playing in the garden. Stephen where? She asked, without even saying hello. Stephen is at home, answered the nanny. Her husband was working on some papers in the study. Are you back already, sweetheart? He asked when he saw his wife enter. Yes, you see, the salon has changed the schedule. Now, instead of Thursday, my day will be Friday, answered Emily. But honey, we're having a family dinner Friday night. Have you forgotten? That's completely impossible, darling. Emily hugged her husband and kissed so he forgot both the salon schedule and the dinner. He loved his wife too much to refuse her so passionate, so young and beautiful. The tumultuous sex bore fruit. Emily had received the coveted authorization. On Friday, Emily entered the lounge of the Agudal restaurant, where she had been more than once. She spotted the Italian almost immediately and settled down at a table. On the contrary, the hall was peaceful, quiet music was playing. Emily did not have to strain much to attract the attention of the foreigner. He gestured to the waiter, and in a minute there was a bottle of expensive wine on the girl's table. This is for you from that gentleman, said in a low voice waiter Emily smiled sweetly and invitingly at the Italian, as if not objecting to him to sit down to her. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mario. Emily extended her hand to the foreigner. The girl always called herself that when meeting men for the first time, 
or when she wanted to make an impression. Are you bored here? No, I just came for a cup of coffee. But since we've met, may I offer you a glass of this fine wine? Emily smiled again. Their conversation was ordinary at first glance, but Emily saw how the Italian's eyes were burning. He already wanted her, and she was anticipating. A total gamble, an adventure. A phone call distracted Stephen from his work. It was his friend John calling. After Stephen got married, they had seen less of each other, and John often reproached his friend for this. Buddy, tell me, what is your precious wife doing in a restaurant with some foreigner? Asked a friend. You are wrong, friend. Emily went to the salon. No, you're wrong. I'm sitting across the street, and I can perfectly see this guy drooling on your wife. John. I don't like you talking about Emily like that. Stephen was outraged. And you check out what I'm seeing. You won't like it anymore. Bye, buddy. The phone beeped. Stephen experienced an unparalleled feeling of jealousy. He was tormented by doubts, and he hurried downstairs to get into the car and see for himself if his friend was right. With John, they had been friends since childhood, and he could not have done such a treacherous thing to him. He certainly couldn't. His imagination painted all sorts of pictures. Here is Emily in the arms of another man. Here he is stroking her, caressing her, and she is writhing with desire. Stephen pressed down on the gas pedal even harder. The last thing he saw was a truck speeding toward him. Before he could react, Stephen swerved into the oncoming lane. The squeal of the tires came from far away. The driver of the truck hit the left column hard and struggled to get out of the car. He tried to pull the man out of the foreign car. He did not manage to pull the victim to the roadside immediately. The bloody driver, as if in a fog, found a phone and called an ambulance. Hello, Emily. The girl heard her father-in-law's voice in the receiver. Stephen had an accident, urgently come to the hospital. It seems that her romantic acquaintance ended this way, almost without beginning. I'm sorry, Mario, she told the Italian, but I have to leave urgently. But can I hope to see you again? Anything is possible. Emily smiled and headed for the exit. At the hospital in a corridor, she saw an agitated Christopher. He was nervous, out of breath and mumbling. A nurse handed Emily a robe. What's wrong? Emily asked her father-in-law. I don't understand anything yet. They said there was an accident on the highway. A collision with a truck. They're operating on him right now. Emily, do you have any idea where he was going? That's when John showed up in the hallway. He was as excited as Christopher. As he asked the man, while they are operating, answered Emily's father-in-law. Emily, you didn't answer my question. Maybe he had some kind of urgent meeting. With whom? I don't know, answered the girl. I was at the salon at the time. I left at lunchtime. Christopher, without stopping, walked down the corridor with his hands on his head. John went to the wall. I know everything, bitch. It's because of you. Stephen, now it's out there and it's not clear whether he's going to live or not. If he doesn't die, maybe he'll be crippled. What did you pretend you didn't know what Emily's man was talking about? I know that you were in the restaurant dating a foreigner. John hissed. You've been cheating on my friend for a long time. Bitch, I was always against him marrying you. You're a roadside bitch. You don't deserve him. Leave me alone and don't make up things that didn't happen. Emily was afraid that the confusion would be caught and the perpetrator would give her away at the scene. A doctor came out of the operating room. All three rushed to him hoping for good news. We operated on him. The damage and the wound are very complex. He's now in intensive care. Doctor, may I see him? With hope in your voice, Christopher asked. Not yet. He's in serious condition and it's unstable. So please go home and we'll let you know if anything changes for better or worse. All three of them headed for the exit. Emily caught John's hateful gaze. Christopher was as if in a stupor, didn't notice anything at all. John offered him a ride. You shouldn't be driving like that. I'll drag you home. You'll be fine. Let's hope for the best. 
He put the man in the car, and he himself walked over to Emily praying to God that he would survive. Otherwise, I'll tell everyone where he was flying at that speed. He turned and walked towards the car. Emily watched him silently. The atmosphere at home was unbearably tense. Almost no one spoke. Even little Camille hardly made any noise or laughed, as if she sensed that her father was on the verge of death. Doctors fought for his life for another month. Stephen's condition was unstable. After a month he was transferred to the intensive care unit and his relatives were given permission to visit him. The hospital room was peaceful with beeps, gauges, and flickering lights. Stephen lay under a sheet with his eyes closed. Christopher and Emily quietly entered the room. Hello, son, quietly said Stephen's father. At the voice of his father, the man opened his eyes blurred. His gaze fell on Emily, and a faint semblance of a smile appeared on his face. However, he could not utter a word. Just watching Emily, she realized he recognized her. For some reason, it was at that very moment that she felt a strong sense of guilt. If Stephen was really going to the restaurant where she was with Mario, how did he know that? Had he set up surveillance on his wife? That didn't sound like her husband at all. He loved her and kind of trusted her and wouldn't let her go. But he just wanted her to be there for him and his daughter. He wanted her to turn into a normal domestic woman for whom family is everything. And she's not like that. She deserves better. Except that only Stephen could give her the best. And Emily understood that. Her husband was stability. And right now, that's in jeopardy. What would happen to her if Stephen didn't survive, if he had another crisis? With these thoughts, she looked at her husband, who could not speak, move, react, or do anything at all. He just lay there and watched. One day, the attending physician, Stephen, asked Emily and Christopher to come in. In the office, he invited them to sit down. This is not going to be an easy conversation. You see, your son and your husband have severe brain changes, so no matter what we do, we can't cure him and get him back on his feet. But how can that be, Christopher? He got better, and he's alive after all. Yes, he's alive. His speech function is impaired, his motor system is not functioning, and over time, his internal organs may begin to fail. Your son will slowly die before your eyes. Christopher, he's up. Tell me, is there nothing that can be done? Any money, any clinic. That's what I want to talk to you about. Is there a very good clinic in Europe where your son could probably be treated? It's expensive, but I've been on the phone with them. They have a very good track record of treating these patients. We can send Stephen there. So what's the holdup? Christopher's getting excited. Wait a minute. Stephen's wife should go with him. The doctor interrupted the man. Why is that? I asked Emily indignantly. It was not in her plans to be with her sick husband. Depriving herself of all pleasures. I'll explain now, began the doctor. You see, we have recorded an improvement in all the indicators of Stephen's condition when you are near him. Such cases are described in the medical literature and are not very common. But I won't torture you with scientific terms and the nature and origin of this phenomenon. You just have to understand. Next to you, Stephen is recovering. It's decided, Emily. You're going to Europe with my son. It's out of the question. Can you do the paperwork? Send me the invoice. Emily stood dumbfounded, watching how cleverly her father-in-law was sending her and her ailing husband to Europe. Stephen and Emily spent exactly two years in a European clinic. That's how long it took to rehabilitate, constantly being close to her husband. Emily, to her own surprise, began to notice that Stephen's progress pleased her. They became closer than they had ever been. They talked and laughed a lot. The treatment in the European clinic really benefited Stephen. Not all functions have recovered yet, but he could already speak normally. The man missed home very much and often talked to his daughter about how good it would be when they returned. How much I missed my daughter, Stephen said one day, looking at a picture of Camille. He often took the picture in his hands and stroked the image of his daughter's hair, her face, as if she were close by. You'll see her very soon. She's very big now. 
Three years old, Emily laughed. When it was time to go home, the doctor told the girl almost the same thing as the attending physician in Russia, you are very good for your husband's health. Understand, this disease is not treated in Russia. At least I do not know such cases. We've done everything in our power. Now it's up to you. You need to stay close to your husband. Any deterioration in his condition is devastating. He will just slowly die and melt before your eyes. As the Russians say, we were told that in Russia too, Emily replied. Really, I don't understand how it can be. The doctor spread his hands and wished them a happy journey. Husband and wife went home. The house was being prepared for Emily and Stephen's arrival. Christopher was playing with Camille, always saying, soon our daddy will be here. And the girl did not understand how, but repeated Papa Papa. When the long-awaited travelers arrived, the little girl said the word again. And Stephen had so many emotions. He wanted so much to pick up his daughter in his arms, to make friends with her. But the man's legs still did not move, and he moved in a wheelchair. Still, joy overflowed his heart. This is my Queen Camille, my daughter, my joy, my happiness all the time, he repeated. The whole family gathered around a large table to celebrate Stephen's return. We have prepared a room for you on the first floor, converted from the guest room, Christopher said, addressing his son. That way you'll be more comfortable going out on your own from the kitchen to the living room. And they built a ramp on the porch. But you've already seen it. Thanks, Dad, Stephen smiled. Life got back to normal. Every morning a nurse and a doctor from the Filth Academy came to see Stephen. A special bed with a comfortable mattress was installed in his room for physical therapy. Therefore, if you had to lie for a long time back, the man did not get tired. A nurse took him out for dinner. He was always present at the common table with other family members, his wife, daughter, and father. Camille would often come into daddy's room with a book or some toy. Look at the doll my grandfather bought me. One day my daughter said, she's beautiful, but she has legs that don't bend like yours. Look. Stephen looked at his daughter with sad eyes. How I want to run around the garden with her, play ball, build a doll's house with her. My legs will definitely bend soon. Daughter, he said, and stroked Camille's head. Have you been given for feces? You met an evil witch. Who told you that? Stephen was surprised at the new version of his illness. Grandpa, he said the wicked witch was laying your feet and our mom would soon split you open. Well, if that's what Grandpa said, then he must have told you. Come on, bring the book, I'll read you fairy tales. Uncomplicated games with her daughter were practically Stephen's only amusement. Emily was often away from home. She always had an excuse to go shopping, or a manicure, or a massage. She no longer spent as much time with Stephen as she had at the European clinic. He was homesick, but Stephen understood she was young and he was an invalid. She couldn't just lie down and lie next to him all day long. One night, Stephen had a terrible dream. A huge black bird grabbed Camille and dragged her away from him. Stephen flew after her on the bed, swirling eddies in their currents. He tried to catch the bird by the tail, but it kept eluding him. Camille's daughter, he shouted and woke up. Stephen wiped the sweat on his forehead with a napkin. In the morning at breakfast, he was as gloomy as a cloud. What's the matter with you, darling? Emily asked. I'm fine. Just slept badly last night. My back was flushed. We should call a doctor, have him take a look at you, and prescribe some new medication. Since these don't help anymore, don't take any. Have a good appetite, everyone. Stephen tried to lighten the mood. In the evening, he waited for his father to arrive. Dad, I need to talk to you alone. All right, let's go to the garden. No one will disturb us there, answered Christopher. In the garden, the rain fell quietly on the edge. The father slowly rolled his son in a wheelchair along the path. Both were silent. The silence was interrupted by the father. I want to make a will for my share of the business. You know, sooner or later, everyone who owns any property thinks about it. It's normal. I don't think anything terrible is gonna happen to you. After all, we're past the worst of it. 
All we can do now is get better. I don't know. Camille's about to turn five, and I still can't get back on my feet. Well, you know, you've got too serious an injury to be treated for a long time, and we're doing everything we can for it. Still, Dad, I want to make a will. And who do you want to include in it? Asked Christopher. A daughter. Stephen answered briefly. If I die, everything I own should go to Camille. It's logical and the right thing to do. But she's too young. And to make matters worse, the will should name a guardian for Vicky to manage her estate until she comes of age. I've already thought of that. Will that be you? You said Stephen. Christopher wheeled his son down the garden path again. Despite the rain, he was thoughtfully silent, not interrupted by Stephen's silence. After a while, already on the approach to the house, the father asked something happened that I don't know about. Something that makes you distrust Emily. Are you sure that's fair? I'm sure. Why? We've been drifting apart lately, and I'm afraid she's gonna leave me crippled for a healthy, normal man. It's not in her best interests, father said suddenly. Stephen looked at him in surprise. Why is that? When you were in the accident and your condition was very bad. As the majority owner of the business, I insured all the assets. I would never leave my only daughter destitute and would always take care of her until my years were over. But to have your part of our business taken over by this. Well, anyway, I took out a business insurance policy. So in the event of my death, Emily gets nothing. No, that's for sure. She'll be penniless on the street. That's why it's wise for her to be with you and her daughter and not get a divorce as long as she's with you. She won't have money problems and she won't need anything. But it is worth it to give her back with her tail and she will end up in her communal room in the Urals. Emily heard the whole conversation. She was about to go out into the garden but she was stopped by the conversation of the men. The girl hid and heard everything to realize her dreams of a happy life in the capital could shatter at any moment. The music was playing loudly in the nightclub. Emily sat at the bar. She was already quite drunk, but she didn't stop. Say again, she said to the waiter. Would you stop? He tried to talk her out of it. I said say again. Okay, but don't be nervous. Before her eyes the story was told. There was no longer one waiter behind the bar, but two. And they were both swimming. How funny are they? Emily thought. A company sat down next to her. Suddenly someone jumped on her with a hug. Emily, hello. How nice to see you. The girl looked in the direction of the voice. It took her a few seconds for her vision to return to normal. Oh Jenna, why are you here alone and so pretty? Come with me to the bathroom. Let's use the old tried and true method of sobering up. The friends hugged each other and headed for the restrooms. After a while, after drinking half a liter of water and a couple of cups of coffee, Emily came to her senses. She had an unbearable urge to sob, so she burst into tears. I don't recognize you, my friend. Did someone die on you? Who? My dream almost died. But that's no reason to write it off. Make up a new dream. In the years they hadn't seen each other, Jenna hadn't lost her optimism. In the life of her friend Emily not always everything was smooth, and sometimes life led her to such dead ends, from which it seemed that there would never be a way out. But life unloved and fun on the walls always twisted out. The girl came from Siberia, having escaped from an orphanage. Here you look at me. She said to her friend, My mother left me at the train station three months old, wrapped in a blanket. In the orphanage, we lived in poverty. I had to steal at the same train station. Here I got to Evelyn a couple of times instead of escorting her. I ended up in a viper's den. I crawled out of there bruised for days. Then I put it off. And now I'm supposed to jump off a bridge. And from the bridge this idea is not completely sobered up. Emily answered in a voice. Come on, you can swim out of any shit in a crisis. What's wrong? I feel like a waste of space, sighed Emily. Wow, a waste of space. You have money. You live in a luxurious mansion. My husband is an invalid, but he's being treated. 
and may soon recover. Things will get better. Girlfriend. No, it won't. He wants to write a will and put everything in his daughter's name. Not a word about me in the goddamn paper. If anything happens to Stephen, what's to say, if he dies, I'm naked. That's what his father said, that I'd go back to the commune. Wow. Jenna was surprised. Why would they do that to you? You're still legally married. Stephen thinks I don't pay enough attention to him. In fact, you could say I don't give him any. So what's the matter? Go to your husband. Be nice to him. What am I teaching you? You know it all. I know it's boring. This is not the life I dreamed of. I thought we'd go to resorts and nightclubs. Oh, come on, girl. People who want to go to bars don't get married, Jenna said. Stephen's illness has taken so long. I mean, we've worked so hard. We've been in that clinic for a long time. We must do everything we can to make sure he gets well. Jenna said thoughtfully, you're doing everything you can to make him sad. He needs positive emotions, but then you give them to him. If you want your husband to recover, it's hard to believe I can do anything about it, but it's worth a try. I just need to feel positive emotions myself. And for that, there's a wonderful remedy Jenna's been conspiring with. What is it? Jenna took out of her purse a bag of small red pills, handed it to her friend. I recommend it. One a day and you walk like a butterfly. The friends chatted some more. Emily got home in the morning. She didn't come out for breakfast. She didn't wake up until lunchtime. Her head was splitting open. Noticing his wife's condition, Stephen asked what's wrong. You don't feel well. She decided there was nothing to hide. Yesterday I met my old friend Jenna. You must remember her. She was at our wedding, Emily said. I remember her. The blonde one with the plump lips. Stephen smiled. We went to a club and had a drink with her. Just, you know, wanted to hang out with someone other than me. You mean honestly, don't you? Well, at least be honest. And you know, I thought we had it all wrong. Emily hugged her husband. Things are gonna be different now. How's that? Stephen was surprised. You'll see. I'll go and get myself cleaned up. Stephen marveled every day at the changes that were happening to Emily. She was now attending his rehab sessions herself every morning, encouraging him and telling him everything would work out. She even tried to bring coffee to his room in the mornings, but the man flatly refused such a favor. No point. It's a crisis. I can go to the canteen myself and drink coffee there with everyone else. Emily was in a good mood every day. She counted cheerfully, played with Camille. Stephen looked at his wife with surprise and quietly rejoiced at her new happiness. She almost never left the house and sometimes even cooked something delicious on her own. Koshina used the cook's recipes. Now they often sat in the garden and drank coffee. They watched Camille play together. We have such a wonderful daughter, Stephen said. She'll be going to school very soon, and then we'll get her into a good college abroad. Do you have far-reaching plans? Emily laughed. I'll tell you more, I want another child. I'll have to think about it, replied the wife. And her answer surprised Stephen again. She did not oppose him and did not persuade him to wait. Sometimes their friend Emily Jenna began to visit their house. After meetings with her, the girl became even more cheerful, and in Moscow, Stephen did not oppose these meetings. Let the friends chat, especially since it favorably affects the atmosphere in their family. True, Emily began to often ask to transfer money to her card, but that didn't surprise Stephen. A wife wants to look better, to please her husband and daughter with new outfits and gifts. What's wrong with that? That day was to be another doctor's checkup. Usually he always came to the house, but this time he called beforehand and asked Stephen and Emily to come to the clinic. The girl called a special car in which people in wheelchairs can be transported, and at the appointed hour they were in the office of their attending doctor. Well, I want to please you young people. The doctor began the conversation. There is a steady, positive dynamics. Emily and Stephen looked attentively at the man in a white coat not understanding what he wanted to say. Today we will conduct a full examination and we will be able to adjust the treatment. 
Are you ready to stay at the clinic for a day? Emily and Stephen looked at each other. Ready, Stephen said. Good. Then a nurse will come and get you ready for your examination. Emily and Stephen returned home in high spirits. The doctor's prognosis was very encouraging. Stephen was clearly on the mend, having considered that Camille was already asleep. They sat in the living room by the fireplace and talked for a long time about how happy they would be once Stephen was well. They dreamed of taking their daughter to the zoo together, of going to the sea and being together forever, and maybe in the near future their family would become bigger. The couple went to sleep far past zero o'clock. The morning began with a scream from the nanny. Emily jumped out of the bedroom, not realizing what had happened. Wendy, she asked, nanny in a sleepy voice. I'm sorry, Emily, but I can't find Camille anywhere. I've been all over the house and her crib. Didn't she spend the night at home? God be with you, Wendy. Where would she sleep at night? I thought maybe she was visiting somewhere. What guests? What are you talking about? Stephen came out of his room in a wheelchair. The women explained to him what had happened. The man was horrified. Who was the last person to see Camille? He shouted throughout the house. Wendy, didn't you put her to bed last night? It was my night off. Emily gave me the day off. Oh my God, I grabbed my head, Emily. I thought we'd be back in no time. They're spending the rest of the afternoon at the clinic. I was putting Camille on the cook. Where's the cook? Stephen shouted again. She's nowhere to be found. I've looked for her, called her, even called her. She's not picking up, said the nanny. So don't panic. Search the whole garden, the garage, the cellar. Stephen started listing places in the mansion where the girl could hide. Search everywhere. I'll call John now. Stephen's friend arrived half an hour later, when and who last saw the girl. He started asking questions right away. We were all at breakfast yesterday morning, said Stephen. And it turns out the cook. We should call the police, John concluded. Put out an APB on your cook. Where's Camille? Where do we look for her? Emily? If we find the cook, we'll find Camille. John reassured her. Do you have an address for this woman? Yeah, somewhere. In the paperwork Christopher used to apply for the job, Emily said. Shit, dad's overseas on a business trip. Can you find the paperwork in his office? Depressed, I said Stephen. In that case, let's run her phone number, the address on it. An hour later the house was full of law enforcement officers. They questioned each one individually. Employees were snooping around the house, something to examine everywhere fumbled, boiled, turned the girl's room upside down. Are you looking for anything in particular? Emily asked the captain. Maybe I can help. We're looking for anything that might indicate the presence of strangers in the house, he replied. Tell me, does the girl know how to open the wicket on the main gate and the servant's entrance on her own? No, of course not. Yes, she is strictly forbidden to go even close to the entrance. Emily answered. At that moment, Jenna, whom Emily had already called, ran into the house. Wait, who are you? A police officer stopped her. Let me in. This is Jenna, our friend. In that case, we should question you too, said the policeman and took the girl under his elbow. They went to the table in the living room. When was the last time you saw the girl? Asked the investigator Jenna over the weekend. Here Stephen and Emily were having a picnic. We all had a good time. Didn't see anything suspicious. There was nothing suspicious. Everything was fine. Maybe some strangers came in, a delivery guy, a check delivery guy, somebody. No, we were the only family. And I used a wheelchair to get into the living room. Stephen, did you run the cook's address? Yeah, a team's on its way to her house. Gradually, the officers finished checking out the house and started to pack up. Before leaving, the investigator said to wait at home, we'll call you. Don't take any independent action. You may harm the investigation. Tell me, are you sure you will find our daughter? Stephen asked. The chances of finding a lost child in the first 24 hours are very high. So wait, we will do our best. And if the child was kidnapped? 
Stephen persisted. Then the kidnappers will come after you, said the investigator. You agree to all the terms and then inform me personally. That's the number the investigator gave Stephen his business card. All day Stephen, Emily, Jenna and John stayed in the house. They said almost nothing to each other, but glanced at each other, trying to be supportive. The silence was interrupted by Stephen. We have to tell my father. Why? Stephen, he's abroad anyway. Emily asked the father of the connection. What if he can help? We're just breaking him up. He'll worry about not being here with us. Christopher came home. The next day, the first Izvestia flight arrived. There was no news of the girl's whereabouts, just as there would be none three days later, and a week later, and a month later. Emily scrutinized his reflection in the mirror, standing in the bathroom. Every morning began the same way. For the third month now, it began with a small red pill. They were regularly brought to the girls by Jenna. The reflection in the mirror did not bode well, only a headache. Stephen sat unmoving in his chair. With Camille missing, the house had become as empty as everyone's soul. It was not only the police who were searching for the child. Having returned from overseas, Christopher had mobilized all his connections. The security service was also joined by concerned people who organize search parties, calm the suburbs. There's no way a child can go missing without a trace. There must be something somewhere to hold on to. She couldn't have left home alone. Stephen kept talking. And just now he wasn't tearing his hair out of his chest out of helplessness. If he could walk, if he wasn't confined to a wheelchair, if he was a healthy man, he would find his daughter. He was sure of it. He was angry at the police, who he thought were inactive, angry at himself, angry even at Emily. It was his wife's fault, in his opinion, for not calling the cook, with whom his daughter was staying that ill-fated day and not telling her that they would be staying at the clinic all day. The cook would have stayed with Camille until they arrived. Suddenly, Emily heard a thud, as if something had fallen. She started slowly down the stairs to the bottom. Stephen was lying on the floor. An overturned stroller was lying next to him. Stephen, what's wrong? The girl cautiously approached her husband. She shook him by the shoulder, but the man was unconscious. Emily began to frantically rummage through her bag. Looking for her phone, it was nowhere to be found. Clouding. From taking the consciousness pills, the thought surfaced that there was a landline in the living room. She dialed the emergency number. Hello, there's a man down. He's unconscious. I don't know. What happened? I came in and he was lying on the floor. He's an invalid. Yes, come quickly. She said it all slowly and each word echoed in her head. Emily remembered how once, when she came home from school to her communal apartment, she had found her father on the floor. He seemed to be dead. The girl ran to call the neighbors, but as on sin, nobody was at home. She shook her father, screaming, Papa, Papa. And then she sat down and cried. She cried out of pity for her alcoholic father, who had finally drunk himself to death. Then she wanted to beat him with her hands and kick him with her legs out of anger. She was really scared that the alcohol had killed her father. But why now, when her husband was lying on the floor and as if not breathing, she was not scared at all. The EMTs brought Stephen to his senses, gave him shots. They stayed with him a little longer and left the prescription on the nightstand. The prescription went away. Emily looked at her husband and felt empty. Why should she care for him? There was nothing tying them together now. The daughter was gone. It's been three months, and it's unlikely she's alive. The investigator said that after three days, there's very little chance of finding someone alive. And it's been three months. Emily poured whiskey into a glass and drank it. She had been drinking more often lately. It made the pain seem less acute. Jenna had almost stopped coming over. Only sometimes, when Emily ran out of red pills, Stephen opened his eyes, looked at Emily slowly, as if through forcefully saying. Emily resumed her search for her daughter. What's the point of this? Already flying tongue answered the girl. Our daughter is dead. She is no longer alive, but she is alive. 
Emily is still her I know for sure. She's alive. Stephen passed out again. Emily left the room. Bullshit. The ramblings of a sick man who's been rendered unconscious by the loss of a child. Christopher came in. Oh, my father-in-law complained. There's nothing to move out. Emily. And what brings you to us? Did your city apartment flood? Or did you miss us? She staggered slightly, pouring herself another shot of whiskey. Emily stopped drinking. John will be here in a minute. We'll discuss again what we can do to find Camille. Oh, you too. Your son's still hoping his little girl's alive too. Where and how? But tell me, where and how can a five-year-old survive alone? The little girl Emily was almost screaming, waving a glass of whiskey. Come on in, John. Have a seat. Have something to drink. Maybe coffee. Christopher saw his son's friend entering the house. Water, if you can. John asked and sat down in a chair. So you say Emily. Where and how alone? Or maybe she's not alone. Maybe she was kidnapped after all. Kidnapped. Maybe she was picked up on the street and they just don't want her back. Is there such a thing? You like the kid. Let her live. Maybe Emily filled the glass again before pouring John. Who needs someone else's baby? He's a burden. You have to feed it, clothe it. But don't tell me. There are cases like organ harvesting. The girl was dumbfounded for a minute, even seemed to sober up. What are you talking about? Shut up. What organs? The girl plopped down in the chair across from the guy. I'd rather she drowned in the river. Christopher returned to the room with a glass of water. He looked at Emily and averted his eyes. Stop drinking. I'm telling you, he raised his voice. We should be looking for the kid and she's boozing. Since law enforcement has put their hands down, we must muster all our strength, devote all our resources to find her dead or alive. Emily's freaking out. Resources, you say? She screamed. What resources? There's your resource lying on the bed. Today he fainted and fell out of his wheelchair. Are your resources disabled? You're all in over your heads. Not today. Tomorrow I'll be a widow. No daughter, no husband. John stood up and approached Emily. He took her by the neck and looked angrily into her eyes with his words about her husband's sick inadequacy. She had put him completely out of patience. Oh, you bitch with anger, he hissed. Why don't you tell Christopher? Why Stephen became an invalid? Why he was killed in that accident? Get off. The girl yanked his arm off. Astol, what's this about John? Turn to the guy man and let her tell you how she cheated on your son. How you see, found out about it. How he went to get her out of the pub where she has fun with men. She's a foreign currency prostitute. I don't get it. Can someone please tell me what's going on here? Yes, he's all rambling drunkenly, said Emily, and leaned back in his chair. He's a prostitute himself. I have always been faithful to my husband. It was time to perplex Christopher. He looked attentively at his daughter-in-law and his son's childhood friend in turn. He could not understand what they were arguing about. But one thing was clear, they were hiding something. But he couldn't get anything out of her now. Come on, tell me, John. God knows. I didn't want to get involved. Especially since I was indirectly responsible for the accident. The guy started his story. He had a business meeting with a partner at Agudol's restaurant that day. It's a small restaurant. There's no private area. So John sat at a table in the corner. He didn't want to sit and talk business in the middle of the room. His partner was late. Suddenly, Emily appeared in the restaurant. She sat down opposite a well-dressed man. It was immediately obvious from him that he was not ours, not a Russian foreigner. So he sits with his feet on his legs, swaying. She took off her slipper a little, as if it had slipped. She pulled her skirt up higher, her breasts almost on the table. She's calling out to the man with all her looks. Naturally, he gave her a bottle of champagne and came to her table. Ten minutes later, a goat was already fixing her up. And this is Arata. Ten more minutes they would have been in bed. That Christopher couldn't contain his emotions. Yeah, he's lying about the mooching. Emily, I wasn't at any restaurant. 
When the accident happened and I realized it was serious, I went through a friend and requested security footage from the restaurant. It's all Emily, and her skirt is almost up to her navel. So before she went to bed with this foreigner, I decided to call Stephen. Christopher, forgive me. I've repented 100 times for calling. I should have gotten her out of the gym and sent her home, then called my friend. But I got emotional and called him. Stephen took everything to the restaurant. He didn't believe me. I wanted to see for myself. And then you know what happened. And he's lying in a drunken voice, and Emily persisted. John, it's true. Christopher couldn't believe his ears. Unfortunately, yes. Here's a flash drive with a recording you can see for yourself. I'm so sorry. It's not your fault. That's what anyone who cared about the fate and life of a childhood friend would do. The man opened his laptop and inserted the flash drive. The screen showed the hall of the restaurant. In a few seconds, Emily in a short skirt and heels entered it and sat down at a table. After a while, she was actually sitting with a man who was adjusting her arm and she was flirting with him in every way possible. It was evident not only from the expression on her face, but also from her gestures. Ah, you're drinking. Christopher could not contain his emotions. Is that why my son is an invalid? That's why he's in trouble. If he hadn't been sick, if he hadn't been away from home, Camille would be here with us. Get out of here. Hey, what's your problem? Emily? That's my house too. It's your house in a communal apartment in the Urals. That's where you should go. Here you go. He threw a $5,000 bill in her driveway. I'm not going anywhere. John, be a pal and throw her out the gate with all due pleasure. The guy grabbed Emily by the arm and dragged her toward the exit. She grimaced, but her strength was unequal. She pounded on the gate for a long time. If you make noise, the neighbors will call the cops. You'll go to the monkey house. Is that what you want? Get the hell out of here, shouted John to her. Christopher sat at the table, propping his head up with his hands. John didn't know how to start a conversation. He stood silent. From the room came the faint moan of Stephen. The men ran at the voice. Stephen came to his senses. He had heard everything that had happened in the living room. Tears were streaming down his face. The doctor who came the next day to examine the patient stated that Stephen's body was severely weakened. It's irreversible. Tell me, did he take all the medications we prescribed? He asked Christopher. Unfortunately, I can't say for sure. I haven't lived in this house for the last few months. I've been staying in a city apartment. It's a shame, a real shame. Stephen wasn't just in permanent remission. He was doing great. He was improving. I didn't tell Emily and Stephen to get their hopes up. But for over three months now, we've had a slight sensitivity in his legs, but it was there. And now, I'm afraid, we'll just have to keep him alive with machines and medication. Stephen's room was once again filled with an enormous amount of equipment. His father hired a nurse and a nurse. Stephen was slowly fading away, and there was nothing the doctors could do. Emily's friend Jenna was from a small Siberian town. After her father stabbed her mother to death in an alcoholic frenzy, she ended up in an orphanage. The girl was only 10 years old, but she had already suffered so much that not every adult to half of life tossed by fate. Finding herself in an unfamiliar place where there were many children and no one seemed to notice her, she found the farthest corner on the playground and sat silently on a bench. You're new. Jenna was brought out of her daze by the voice of the boy who sat down next to her. Yes. What's your name? Jenna. I'm Beetle. The boy said cheerfully. Jenna looked at him in surprise. Why a bug? She didn't get it from the makeup. I got it here because my last name is Beetle. My name is Jack. But I like it better. Jack is some kind of dog name. Did your parents give you up? Did Jenna hesitate to tell or not? To a boy, she didn't know the truth about her life. My daddy stabbed my mom to death. I came home from school, and she was lying on the floor with a lot of blood, and my father was gone. I called the neighbor, and she called the police. 
And then they took me here. It's awful, Jack said. Don't be afraid of anything here. I'll protect you. You want me to. The girls here are mean. And the boys fight all the time. You tell me if anything happens. Okay. The beetle ran away and Jenna stayed on the bench until they called for dinner. From that day on, she had a reliable protector. No one touched the girl, but she wasn't invited to be friends with other kids. But the beetle was always near. They often escaped from the orphanage at night and fried bread on the fire on the riverbank. It was the beetle who taught her how to smoke, cigarettes, and pot. And when they graduated from the orphanage, he got a bottle of wine somewhere. You've never had a drink. Of course not. Now we're gonna get drunk and have fun. Why sit there with those fools on our shore? It's much better. They drank wine, smoked cigarettes, and laughed a lot. Beetle became Mastu's first man. Although, in fact, they were still teenagers, but after the feelings they experienced, they realized that they were now adults. And where are you going? After the orphanage, asked Jenna Guy. I'm going to the capital. There are a lot of people there. I'll probably find a job. The beetle bought a cigarette and handed it to Jenna. Yeah, but what kind of seamstress am I? I want to be a photo model. The beetle laughed and fell on the grass. Wine intoxicated their heads and life seemed to open up one thousands of possibilities. Hey, photo model. The guy kept laughing. You can't get a job there without connections, and someone has to have a potato nose. Jenna pouted, and already puffy lips took offense, but after a minute rolled on the grass with her friend, choking with laughter. Where are you going? Suddenly serious, she asked. I don't know yet, but definitely not to the factory. It's not for me to hump at the machine. And every day I burned a cigarette and took a puff. I'll probably go to David. He promised to help with the work, and in general with David you won't be lost. David was a sort of local provincial authority. He collected tribute from small businessmen and market traders. Beetle often moonlighted doing his small errands. He chewed the fat with cigarettes and weed. When money appeared, made little gifts to Janet in the form of hairpins or beads. Guy liked that the work wasn't dusty, and David always treated him favorably. He's a former orphanage kid himself. After graduation from the orphanage, the guy's paths diverge. Jenna, really at the first opportunity, left and fell into the ranks of Courtney and Evelyn. She was quite content with a well-fed and beautiful life that was in no comparison to what she saw in her backwater. They had met completely by chance at Jenna's nightclub. What about you? She heard a familiar voice in the semi-darkness and clouds of cigarette smoke. She looked at the guy who stood in front of her for a few seconds. The girl hung around the guy's neck. Where'd you come from? Oh, life has brought me here. Come on, sit down. Tell me all about it. Have you been here long? No, I've been here a few months on business. I'm just hanging around till I can't go anywhere. What meeting? Jenna was broadcasting. We should celebrate. Let's order a drink. The girl told about her life about the crowds with whom she had to go to different events, go on business trips and on vacation to have fun, and sometimes even sleep with them. Beetle was more silent, only looked at her with a strange look. Where do you live? Suddenly asked Jenna. I rented a shanty town in the suburbs. I don't have any more money, but there are ways to get some good dough. You want to get a job. You're going to get a job. The girl laughed. Yeah. I'm in a hurry. No, Jenna. Now real dough can be raised and not working every day will share. Maybe they started meeting at the nightclub from time to time. One day, a bug offered Jenna little red pills at a flying thing. Just don't get addicted in a hurry, a friend suggested. But it's great for selling to suckers and expensive. Asked Jenna. It's all right. It's enough to live on. You got someone to offer it to. Yeah. I got a rich friend here. Doesn't need money. Husband's got money. So go ahead, we'll split the profits. At the next meeting, the bug told Jenna that he took a large shipment of red pills, and we need to push as soon as possible to pay off the supplier. Where are we pushing so many times? 
puzzled Jenna. You have a lot of girlfriends, acquaintances. In the club again, constantly hang out, advised the guy. Stephen was fading away. Christopher hardly ever left the house, despite the constant presence of the nurse. He tried to spend more time with his dying son. The doctor began to come less and less often and more often just listen to the patient's condition over the phone. In the rare hours when Stephen regained consciousness, he would say to his father in a weak voice, Dad, how can this be? I'm gonna die without ever seeing my little girl. My queen Camille, we're looking for her, we're looking for her son. Christopher tried to comfort his son, but he didn't believe he would ever find his granddaughter alive. It seemed as unreal as curing his only son who was terrifying in front of his eyes. He himself often fell into despondency, realizing that in his old age he would be alone in this huge house. But not so long ago, there were voices here. Little Camille was running around. I don't want to die without seeing my daughter, Stephen said. He was going crazy, not knowing what to do for his son. The doctor said that medicine does not yet know a cure for his disease. The only thing that can be done is to help him bear the pain. But the painkillers were working. The bad ones didn't last long and they had to be replaced with better ones all the time. In the hours of unconsciousness, Stephen was delirious. He kept saying his daughter's name, calling her name, and calling her queen. And Christopher couldn't hold back the tears as he watched his son suffer. If Camille had been there, Stephen would be easier. He wouldn't be in so much pain. She's his comfort, he thought. But it had been two years since Camille had disappeared. There was no chance of finding her. The bug called Jenna and said they had to meet urgently. What's the rush? Asked the girl, falling into the soft chair opposite her friend. We have problems. Conspirator in such a tone began Beetle. I was almost taken by the cops. I barely got away. Well, you did, so live and enjoy it, said Jenna. Light a cigarette. I left, but I had to dump the whole lot. Are you out of your mind? Jenna pulled her eyes out. What was I supposed to do if they took me in with the merchandise? You'd be in the slammer for 12 years. Where'd you get the money? I'd be stabbed to death by the dealers. I don't even know what's worse, the cops or the dealers. Jenna smoked thoughtfully. Over the past few months, she had become a real dealer at the Beetle. And the two of them were great at knocking down pills and breaking in well. She had even considered how to pay Evelyn off and start a new life. Now, if the bar girls get the bug uh, he'll pull her down with him. Which means it's a two-person problem. I have one option, she said thoughtfully. Do you remember my friend, to whom I sold wheels, but whose husband is disabled? Yes, yes. So you can steal her daughter, her husband. Wouldn't spare any money for her daughter. He loves her. Are you crazy? Steal a child. The beetle waved his arms. Do you have any other options? Asked Jenna. It's not hard. He's confined to a wheelchair. His wife is a peasant fool and can't do anything on her own. Take the girl, then set a ransom, and on the appointed day get the money. And return the child. We just have to find a place to hide her while they prepare the ransom. I've already got a beetle in my shack. That's a good idea. The girl knows me well. So it shouldn't be a problem. I'll tell you the day when everything will be done. Stephen was getting worse. Every day the irreversible processes in his body became more and more obvious. Christopher was discouraged but watched his son's condition and agonized at his inability to do anything about it. Tormented by his helplessness, cursing the failure of medicine, calling on the help of the Lord God. Sometimes Stephen's delirium became so horrible that inside the man walked. Daughter, raved Stephen, holding out his arms. You've been found, my darling. You've come to your daddy. My little one, don't go away. Sit down next to me. Bring me a book and I'll read it to you. Where's your new Camille doll? Her legs still won't bend, just like your daddy's. At times like this, Christopher would give all his fortune, all his money, just to make his son feel better, just so he wouldn't suffer but he was powerless to fight his son's illness and could not even alleviate his suffering. 
Ah, if Camille had been there, Stephen would have had an easier time, a much easier time. That day, when Stephen and Emily went to the clinic, Camille stayed with the cook. The girl was playing quietly in Camille's nursery. Come on, I made you some cheese. Your favorite, called the housekeeper to the girl. Camille obediently sat down at the table. She ate with pleasure and drank juice. Now go play in the garden, little girl, said the cook. Look how nice the weather is. Take your favorite doll and walk with her. I'll take everything. The housekeeper took care of the chores. Vicky's nanny had the day off today, so the owners asked her to look after the baby. It's no big deal. Camille is a very obedient girl. She won't be a problem. It's not the first time the cook has stayed with the child. From time to time, she looked out the window where Camille was playing with her dolls on the lawn. When the housekeeper went to the window to see what the child was doing, she did not see Camille on the lawn. The woman ran out into the yard, calling loudly for Camille. Camille, where are you? But there was no answer. The woman rushed to look in the garden, ran all up to the nursery again. The child might be there, but even there the little girl did not appear, not knowing what to do. The housekeeper at first wanted to call Stephen and Emily, but then imagined the responsibility she might incur for Camille's disappearance. Those rich men wouldn't just fire her, they'd put her in jail. The cook quickly took off her apron and left the house. At that moment, running away seemed to her the only right thing to do. She could run to her aunt's house and no one would find her. Jenna brought Camille to the apartment rented by a bug on the outskirts of the city. The girl had a doll in her hands. Where is my mom? Asked the girl Camille. Affectionately said Jenna. Mommy and daddy went to the doctor to fix daddy's feet. And you and I are going to stay here. We'll wait here. Okay. Okay. In two hours. The girl was hungry. But there wasn't any food in the cold. Jenna called her partner in crime. Buy the kids something to eat. Why? I don't know what they eat. Well, buns, buy yogurt, apple, I don't know what they feed her either. The bug showed up on the doorstep of the apartment an hour and a half later with a bag of groceries. Sorting out the purchases, Jenna grumbled. Why did you buy vodka? We need a sober head, and you decided to get drunk. I'm getting the jitters from all this, replied the beetle. I'm nervous. The parents have probably already discovered that the girl is gone. I don't think so, said Jenna. They've gone into town for a doctor's appointment. And that will take some time. The servants are probably panicking by now. When we demand a ransom. Wait, we need to give them time to get nervous. We can't do anything until tomorrow. I'll go to them. Find out what's going on in the house. What they think and what they're willing to do for their daughter. Camille, sitting on the floor, chewed a bun. Beagle and Jenna looked at her. They are not going to hurt her. Just have her parents give them one million for her. And that's it. Back to normal. All night Camille cried and called for her mom and dad. The kidnappers didn't know how to calm her down. And the neighbors could hear the baby crying behind the wall and call the police. However, in this barracks, the neighbors are alcoholics. They are unlikely to care about the cries of a child. After spending a sleepless night and calming the girl in the morning, Finally, everyone fell asleep. The next day, Jenna went to her friend, who had already called her and told her what had happened. She returned with a look of panic on her face. Damn, everything was gone from the doorstep, she declared. Missing how? Don't they want the baby? Well, they do. They're all worked up in there. A house full of police. That's half the problem. You could tell them not to call the police or we kill the kid. They certainly wouldn't have called. I know both Emily and Stephen well. What didn't the beetle realize? Stephen's father is coming, Jenna answered. And what didn't the sidekick realize? What what? This isn't Stephen's invalid wife and Emily's idiot. This is a serious man with connections with his security service, which will quickly calculate us. He's not gonna fall for a ransom like that. Emily tried to talk Stephen out of calling his father. I thought he'd listen to her. But that handicapped guy realizes he can't find his daughter without a hitch. So what do we do now? 
The frustrated beetle sat down on the couch. I don't know. Let's think about it. What if we can't get a ransom for the girl? Where are we gonna put the baby? I mean, they're looking everywhere for him. Yeah, the police are all over it. All exits from the city are blocked. All neighborhoods are being searched. Her picture's all over the TV channels, and there's groups of concerned people all over the city looking for her, and the police are involved. And then there's this John friend Stephen. He's also a complicated man with connections, and he can return a lot of things. She's not gonna get away with it. How do we get her back? And the ransom. The guy cried out. Are you stupid? What ransom? Jenna shouted indignantly. As soon as we make a call, we'll be instantly figured out or taken in when we hand over the money. So, I don't get it. How are we going to give the money to the dealers? Shut up. Jenna began to lose her temper, and it was necessary to think calmly how to behave further and what to do with the child. She went to the window and smoked a cigarette. There were no options. They themselves hung another article on themselves in addition to drugs and kidnapping a child. With such cases, any court would send them to jail for 20 years. And then Jenna had a crazy idea. Hello, Evelyn. When Christopher appeared on the doorstep with the girl, the housekeeper aghast dirty grimy, the child did not dare, stomped on the mat. The girl was wearing tattered clothes clearly off the adult shoulder sleeves. She briskly tucked our coat and up to the shoulders on her feet boots size three more. Who's that? Christopher? She asked in bewilderment. Please wash the baby properly when you scratch it. And yes, look in the room. Camille, some things for her there in the closet There is probably something that was bought for growing up. The man looked at the girl with an appraising gaze, though she's not much different in stature from my granddaughter. Small, skinny. You'll find something, I think. The housekeeper answered well. She took the girl into the bathroom and undressed her and squeamishly put her clothes in a garbage bag. The woman bathed the child for a long time in the warmer, and she kept quiet, although it was obvious that she did not like bathing at all. Apparently, it's unaccustomed. What, she hasn't been bathed for six months? I thought the housekeeper rubbed the girl's body, the scent with soap. For the third time, the child was very thin, blue veins shining through the thin skin. The woman wrapped her in terry towels, sat her in a chair. Then she combed her blonde hair, made her pigtails sick. Now you look like a normal child. And Nena Onishchenko from the underpass, the kind that begs for money. She said more to herself than to the girl. But the girl suddenly replied, All the children there are like that. It's cold and you can't wash. Poor thing. The woman's heart was overcome with pity and tenderness. Come on, I'll feed you. The housekeeper put on the girl a pink Camille dress and pantyhose and put on her feet a homemade shoe and took her to the dining room. At the table, the child ate with the greediness of an animal that had not been fed for a long time. She ate a whole bowl of soup and happily began putting drinking juice. When Christopher entered the dining room, he sat down opposite the child and looked at the girl carefully. For about five minutes he looked at her without taking his eyes off her. And suddenly, the man's eyebrows crept upward, and his eyes began to round. This is incredible. He exclaimed. What's your name? Child. Camille replied as she continued to chew. Tears rolled down the man's face. He could not contain his emotions. In front of him sat his granddaughter, his Camille, who had disappeared two years ago. Auntie. Why is uncle crying? Asked the little girl to the housekeeper. Push, and the little girl stroked her head. Christopher stared at the child. He could not believe that he had found his granddaughter, whom no one had been able to find for two years. He couldn't wait to bring her to Stephen, but he waited patiently for the child to eat. When the girl had finished eating, he said to her, come with me, I'll introduce you to someone. The girl obediently took the man's hand. They went to Stephen's bedroom. He was asleep. Christopher moved the chair, the bed, his son. Sit down, he told his granddaughter. He decided that they would sit together at Stephen's bedside for as long as it took. Until his son came to his senses, 
let him see his daughter in front of him. Let him be glad that she had been found. Stephen opened his eyes. His gaze hadn't been meaningful lately, to come to his senses and realize what was happening around him. He needed some time. The man stared at the ceiling for a long moment, then began to sweep the room with his eyes, looking for the nurse or his father. His gaze stopped on the child sitting in the chair. Camille a little audibly, he said. You've been found, my girl. Yes, son, I have found our Camille. A faint, but so pure and happy smile appeared on Stephen's face. 